Some of the rules for collecting for, for this purpose are that older is better and no plastic. There are a few minor little exceptions like some of the lighting has plastic in it. But as far as the objects go, I try to avoid the plastic. I don't know how many objects are in here, maybe 10,000 if I count the objects that are in the boxes. All of the boxes have things in them unless it's a recently acquired box and I haven't had time to fill it yet. I have uh, never thought to count even the boxes. Uh, my estimate is about 400 boxes. Um, the shelves are mostly made either of crates or drawers that I found usually from desks or chests of drawers uh, from, from uh, furniture that's been dumped in the alley. And the drawers are really nice because of the fact that they're shallow and therefore the objects that I place in them are fairly close up front. A few crates that I've also found in alleys are picked up at secondhand shops. Um, there's some soda crates that have nice dividers in them that work well. Most of the stuff that I've gathered here has come either from secondhand stores or alleys or been given to me because people figure out that, um, you know, I have a certain aesthetic going on here and they think, oh, Ben would like this. And uh, it finds its way into this room. This room is really in many ways part of my private life. I haven't shared it with a lot of people. Close friends have seen this, but until now, I've never done anything really public with it. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I'm willing to do that now is because I've retired. And I figure it's okay for my eccentricities to become exposed. Collecting for me started when I was about 10, and I'm 60 now, so this is 50 years of collecting. And uh, it, it started when my grandfather gave me a box to keep my things in. And I don't know what motivated me to keep things in it that were, you know, older and more, um, more unusual. I remember one of the first things I put in the box was a walnut that had three divisions instead of two. It was a little bit of a fluke. And uh, then um, other things found their ways into the box. Um, foreign coins, um, silver spoons, and uh, that kind of thing. So um, it uh, has grown over a period of um, 50 years now. And it's one of those things that you can only do if you have a good bit of stability in your life. So I've, I've lived in this house now for 22 years along with Jane. And um, I've pretty much confined the collecting to this room. Uh, but the fact that first of all, we have a spare room where I can do this. And second, we haven't been moving a lot over the past, we haven't been moving at all over the past 22 years, means that um, 
Um, you know, I can come in here when I feel like it and need a little time to myself and just do some of the arrangements. The arrangements are really as important as the objects and um, it's for me a way of um, meditating in a way of um, finding a little bit of peace and uh, it, it's a place I can disappear to and just get lost in. So as I look around the room, I can just think of um, the um, uh, origins of a lot of these objects and uh, the, uh, the, the windows here, for example, that I've turned into shelves, the glass windows, came from Pompbon University, where I taught for 27 years. They were gutting a floor of the university, and I got permission to remove all of the glass windows um, that faced out from the offices onto the hall. They were transom windows, and uh, I retrieved about 30 of those, and uh, the rest are down in the basement. Um, the um, big cabinet over here in the corner came from a house about um, 15 blocks from here in um, the uh, Tower Grove neighborhood that had burned down. And they were leveling the house and it uh, had been a cupboard in the house. And so I brought it home. It was covered in char and I uh, sanded all of the char off to get down to bare wood. Um, the shovels that are hanging are um, shovels that I found in the alleys over the years. Um, one, one of the things that was true about this neighborhood, Benton Park, when we first moved here was that a lot of the houses were being rehabbed. That was in the early 2000s. And they would just, the rehabbers would just toss things they found in the house into the alleys or into dumpsters in the alleys. Uh, construction dumpsters, not garbage dumpsters. And um, so, so the alley pickings were really good uh, 15 to 20 years ago. Not so much anymore, first of all, because the um, houses have largely been rehabbed. And second, because there's more competition. A lot of the younger people around here are also finding the joy of alleys. And uh, so they get to things before I do. Um, the, um, Wrought iron here is actually part of this house. It was from the front. It was in the basement when we moved in here because it had been torn off or had fallen off. And we've just never replaced it to the front, but I've used it in here instead. Alphabet blocks that are scattered around the room are um, uh, from the, almost exclusively from the big Goodwill outlet uh, just just off of um, Highway 40. Pieces of desk that have the drawers in them um, are um, alley finds. And the um, uh, card catalog, and the drawers all have things in them too, um, came from Fontbonne University. Uh, and again, I didn't steal it. I uh, bid on it and got it for a great price. Um, the Crates over here, the metal crates that are just great for hanging objects from and positioning objects within, uh, were donated by my dear friends Donna Mingo and Lila Turner um, when they moved from a house in South City to a loft in um, the downtown area. So, you know, it's kind of funny. I know the origins of most of the things in here. Maybe some of them I've forgotten. Um, and whoever ends up inheriting this is not going to know those origins. And it's one of those things where the stories of the acquisition gets lost. And of course, I don't know all the stories that underlie these objects. Um, you know, I can imagine the stories in many cases, but I don't know them except in a few cases. Um, and um, th this is one of the things that uh, provides me a point of meditation when I come in here is to imagine the kind of history that these objects have gone through over the decades. Some of my favorite boxes are 
what I call tribute boxes, and they center on a particular person. Um, they're filled with the um, remnants of the life of this person, or some of those remnants. You know, for example, over here I've got a um, tackle box that was my grandfather's, the same grandfather that gave me my first box, my mother's father. He went fishing a lot and tied his own flies, and in that box are many of those flies, some sinkers that he cast from his sinker mold, his um, um, fishing licenses, and a number of other things that were associated with his fishing. Uh, this box was um, from my spouse's grand, uh, grandfather. He was a um, watch repairman, and um, he did that mainly for a hobby, and there are all kinds of watch-related items in this box. Uh, there are things like an old Wilkinson razor blade, um, stamps, um, and a watch face. Um, not to mention all kinds of watches, many of them pocket watches. So far as I know, they don't work anymore. Um, but th th there's a kind of symbolic quality to them, uh, perhaps that is enhanced by the fact that they don't work. Um, time for everybody comes to an end. Um, and um, these tribute boxes are um, just a reminder of the way in which we leave little pieces of ourselves as we go along our way and most of these end up just getting lost but a few of them of various kinds end up uh, surviving and I often think of the items in this room as pieces of other people's lives that have been brought here and, and congregated in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise. The doll parts are um, a little bit of an exception to the way that I've acquired things because I, um, I, I frankly got them off of um, Craigslist. And I met a man who had these. He had picked them up at an auction and I bought him from them in a um, town that is um, not too far from St. Louis, Eureka. Um, it was an interesting moment because it was two middle-aged men dealing in doll parts, um, but uh, they were ceramic and so they fit the aesthetic of the room and, um, you know, I like them because they're frankly a little bit creepy. Um, I keep those in drawers. There are a few of them scattered around the um, room, placed uh, along with other objects. The neon is um, for me, an important part of the room. Uh, neon has had a really special attraction to me ever since I visited my father in Miami in 1980. I took the Greyhound back, and it was a night route. And it went up the Florida coast, and it passed all kinds of uh, tumble-down hotels that had neon out front. And as the bus traveled through the night, I just got mesmerized with all of the neon. And it was shortly after that that I acquired my first neon sign that broke during one of my moves in graduate school, so I don't have it anymore. But I'm attracted to the cold light, the fact that you can touch it and feel no heat, the fact that it can be molded into any letter or shape, the fact that it's a conjunction of light and text. And a lot of the neon in here is uh, vintage. Um, for example, the cleaner sign, the spick and span cleaner sign, uh, dates back uh, to the 1940s. Um, I um, also like the way it, show, it throws a colored light over the objects in the room. So one of the things I ask myself from time to time is, am I a hoarder? And uh, I, I think there's an element of hoarding in this room. Um, but there are also a few things that distinguish it from hoarding. Um, one is that the arrangement, as I've said, is just as important as the object. An another distinguishing factor is I'm really pretty selective about the, pro the objects that come in here. And finally, I'm, I'm really well aware that these objects are going to slip from my hand one day in one way or another. 
um, either I will outlive this collection or the collection will outlive me, but in one way or another it's going to go somewhere else. Uh, just as these objects have slipped from the hands of people who may have held them in the past. Um, and um, I've begun to think a little bit about what's going to happen to all of this. And I, I just imagine different things. One is that I just invite my friends over and have them take what they want. Another is that maybe somebody wants this as a whole collection sometime in the future and I work with them to transfer it. That would be quite an undertaking, not only because it would take quite a long time to disassemble and move the objects, but also a long time to reassemble them somewhere. But in one way or another, this will leave me or I will leave it. Uh, you can't hold on to these things permanently. And um, they, um, they speak to the passage of time and they speak like this tribute box does to the impermanence of life.